Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Welcome to this Cold War International History Project book launch for For the Soul of Mankind, the United States, the Soviet Union, and the Cold War by Professor Melvin Leffler to my left. Um, let me welcome you on behalf of um, Lee Hamilton, the staff here to the center, um, Christian Osterman, I direct Cold War International History Project, which for the last um, now more than 15 years, I'm afraid, has um, tried to unearth new sources, new evidence on Cold War International History, and every now and then tries to provide a forum here in the heart of Washington for the presentation and discussion of new and important relevant findings and publications such as the book that's at the center of today's event. Before I introduce our two panelists, uh, let me just make a couple of uh, brief announcements. Let me uh, advise you of a couple of future events organized by the Cold War Project. Um, we're featuring a book discussion of uh, Greg Brzezinski's uh, new book uh, on October 12th, Nation Building in South Korea, Koreans, Americans, and the Making of a Democracy, October 12th from 4 to 5.30 p.m., an event that we're doing in co-sponsorship with George Washington University's Cold War Group and Institute of European and Russian Studies, as well as our uh, Asia program um, here at the center. Greg Brzezinski will be talking about his book, and uh, Professor William Stick will discuss um, the book, and there may be additional panelists as well. On October 16th, we have another exciting event, um, a book launch, book discussion for uh, Vladislav Zubok's new book, A Failed Empire, the Soviet Union in the Cold War from Stalin to Gorbachev, October 16 from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Uh, Vladislav Zubok, one of the, um, of course, um, uh, most prolific um, uh, historians working on the Cold War, in particular on the Soviet role in the Cold War. Um, on November 8th, um, we're featuring a, a screening of a, a new documentary, Between the Lines, Zwischen den Fronten, a documentary by uh, East German-born um, filmmaker Dirk Simon um, about uh, the Berlin Wall. Um, this will take place November 8th um, in the afternoon here in the auditorium to be followed by panel discussion with um, the director and, um, uh, and scholars and, and eyewitnesses. And then on November 15th, I'd like to invite all of you to the 2007 Jan Ratio Democracy Lecture um, here at the center, 4 to 6 p.m. Again, here in the auditorium to be followed uh, by um, a reception this year's um, Awardee and lecturer is Professor Dr. Anatoly Mikhailov, uh, president of the European Humanities University in Vilnius, Lithuania. Let me also not be amiss to thank um, my wonderful staff who has made this event here today possible. Uh, Kristina Tertseva cannot be with us this afternoon, but Timothy McDonald, all the way in the back, um, one of our new program assistants, has been working hard on this event. He and his dedicated um, uh, uh, group of interns and junior scholars that we have with us um, this fall. Now, we have uh, uh, two um, eminent speakers here to talk about this very important new publication. Of course, the author himself, uh, Melvin P. Leffler, uh, who is Statinius Professor of American History 
at the University of Virginia, and as my notes here say, a renowned author. He has indeed, since completing his studies at Cornell University and Ohio State University, he has published a number of books and received fellowships from institutions as varied as the American Council on Learned Societies, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, the, Librarian of, the Library of Congress, where he was the, um, uh, where he um, held the Kissinger Share, um, and the United States Institute of Peace. We're, of course, also delighted to welcome him back as a 2001-2002 uh, public policy scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Mel is also a former dean of the college and graduate school of arts and, scientists, arts and sciences at the University of Virginia and the past president of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. His um, many publications include, uh, of course, The Specter of Communism, the United States and the Origins of the Cold War, 1970 to 1953, published in 1994, and The Preponderance of Power, National Security, the Truman Administration, and the Cold War, published a year earlier, which won the Bancroft, Farrell, and Hoover Prizes. He is currently editing a three-volume Cambridge History of the Cold War, co-editing it with Professor Adarna Vestad at the LSE, and he is beginning work on a book on George W. Bush and American foreign policy. Well, it's with great pleasure to welcome you back, to congratulate you on the publication, this, accom this accomplishment, and look forward to your talk. And mm -hmm. after Mel's remarks, I'll introduce our commentator, Professor Robert Beisner. Mel, you can go. Either way. Well, it's a great pleasure to, to be back at the Wilson Center, and a um, particular pleasure to see so many people here, so many old friends, uh, so many young people. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for me uh, to be able to uh, talk about this book that I've been working on uh, for more than a decade. And uh, I have um, particular thanks uh, to Christian, not only for that nice introduction, but to all the folks here at the Wilson Center, to, uh, to Sam Wells, Rob Litwack, Lee Hamilton, of course, Christian, uh, and others uh, who allowed me, uh, in essence, uh, to come back here in 2001, 2002, uh, after I had served as dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences for four years at UVA, and I really needed a respite. I really needed um, to have a place um, where I could think about scholarly issues um, in a quiet uh, stimulating environment. 2001, 2002 didn't turn out to be a quiet environment, uh, but it certainly was a stimulating environment, and I owe a great deal to the folks here at the Wilson Center and to the Cold War His International History Project um, for really doing so much to make this book possible. I also want to take uh, just a second to uh, thank the people at the National Security Archive, uh, Tom Blanton and Malcolm Byrne, uh, Bill Burr, and perhaps in some ways most of all Svetlana Severonskaya, um, who did so much uh, to aggregate documents, um, not only from the United States through freedom of declassification, but also to uh, secure documents from Eastern Europe, and particularly the Soviet Union, and Svetlana in particular, was phenomenally generous in sharing the documents she was um, securing and that could be made available, and she translated a fair number herself. And those that she did not translate, I was lucky to have uh, two graduate students from Georgetown, both of whom are here today, Anton Fedyashin and Isaiah Gruber, who did uh, a wonderful job uh, translating documents for me, and uh, more than just translating, they became so involved in the product, in the project itself, and so very supportive. Um, they, they really nurtured me through uh, some of the agonies of, of writing this book, and, and I owe them a lot. So thanks, Anton. Thanks, uh, Isaiah. 
So many people um, have asked me why, uh, after writing um, two books essentially about the origins of the Cold War, why I decided to write another book about the entire Cold War. And the answer um, is really uh, threefold. Um, one is that I genuinely was surprised by the end of the Cold War. Um, in the early and middle and even in the late 1980s, uh, I had no idea uh, that the Cold War was going to end. I did not foresee the end of the Cold War. In fact, nobody I knew um, foresaw the end of the Cold War. Nowadays, a lot of people looking back, we try to identify all those people who were so wise to envision the end of the Cold War, but somehow my memory uh, suggests to me that very few of those people were apparent uh, in the mid-1980s, mid and I certainly was not one of them. I had no idea the Cold War was going to come to an end, and um, when it did, I really wanted to know why it ended. And since it finally did come to an end, why did it last as long as it did? Uh, why could it have not been resolved earlier? And therefore, what were, the cold, what were the Cold War's underlying dynamics? Second reason I wanted to write a book about the overall Cold War was because of the fantastic interest uh, that inhered in the new documents coming out of the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, East Germany, and Eastern Europe. These documents um, have been written about by lots of other people. Um, they are incredibly important for understanding the Cold War. They've had a tremendous impact on me, but it was always my fundamental conviction that the utility of these documents would only be understood in their totality when they were complemented with things that we already knew about the Western side of the Cold War and that we were still learning from emerging documents that were coming out of some of the presidential libraries. The so third reason I wanted to write a book about the underlying dynamics uh, of the Cold War was that I really wanted to challenge myself in a, number, in a number of ways. When I wrote A Preponderance of Power, although many people thought that I had done a reasonably decent job analyzing the Truman Administration's national security policies, I clearly had not attended to the Soviet side of the Cold War. The documents from the Soviet side of the Cold War had not then been available. When I thought about this project, I wanted to see, could I really write a book about the Cold War in which I could deal even-handedly and intelligently with the Soviet side uh, as well as with the American side? This presented a particular challenge to me because I do not read Russian. Um, I was in need of having the services of the Cold War History Project, which had been translating lots of documents, particularly with regard to the end of the Cold War. Uh, the National Security Archive was involved in this project of securing and translating a fair number of documents. And um, I had lots of graduate students working on this. But the challenge was, could I deal with the Soviet side as well as with the American side? Could I capture, for example, Stalin's brutality, yet also illuminate the contingency that inhered in his actions. Could I elucidate the paradox that existed for so many officials in Moscow as well as in Washington? The paradox that leaders on both sides of the Cold War at the very same time felt great power but also felt great fear. That paradox of power and fear, it's so important in the policy-making process. I suggest to you that it's been incredibly important in the policies of the last five or six years of the Bush administration. But I try to show in this book how this paradox of fear and power, both together, had such an important role in nurturing, stimulating um, uh, the, the Cold War. Could I effectively deal with ideology and public opinion? All of us who write books read the reviews of our books. 
One of the criticisms of preponderance of power was that I had not dealt deftly enough with the issue of ideology. Some people thought I hadn't dealt deftly enough with the issue of public opinion. So in conceptualizing this new book, I did so with an explicit desire to see if I could come up with a framework that would allow me to assess, among other things, the role of ideology and public opinion uh, in a systematic, thoughtful way. And lastly, I wanted to probe human agency with greater depth and subtlety than I had ever done before. I had written fairly substantial books on the Hoover administration and uh, another one, as you know, on the Truman administration. I dealt a lot in both those books with the larger decision-making processes of those administrations. But I never felt that I necessarily caught the essence of the human beings themselves, especially of the presidents. And I wanted in the book that I was going to write to see if I could deal with leaders in a more effective way than I had ever done before. Now, two aspects uh, of the new documents um, from Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union and elsewhere particularly impressed me. First, Soviet leaders really, truly believed they represented an alternative and superior way of organizing human existence. This is not something that they just said publicly. This view was a conviction that they repeatedly shared with one another at their own Politburo meetings. They believed sincerely that they had a system that could provide health and education and opportunity more effectively to their people than capitalism. They truly believed they were waging a struggle for the soul of mankind. And so did US officials. The title of my book, For the Soul of Mankind, comes from a quotation by George Herbert Walker Bush, who said in the introduction to another book that the Cold War was a struggle for the very soul of mankind. I hadn't thought so when I began research on this book, but by the end of my research, I was convinced that that statement, that quotation, embodied the essence of what the Cold War was about, a struggle for the soul of mankind. But what was really interesting was that while officials in both Washington and Moscow believed they represented, they represented alternate ways of organizing human existence, political economies, etc., Nonetheless, what emerges in the documents, and what's so very interesting, is that they also frequently realized that the Cold War was counterproductive to their own interests, that the Cold War was counterproductive to their interests. Leaders in Washington and Moscow believed that the Cold War diver diverted resources and attention from domestic priorities. They believed that the Cold War embroiled them in wars on the periphery, in Southeast Asia and in Africa, that they knew were not vital to their interests. Leaders in both Washington and Moscow grasped that the Cold War could culminate in nuclear war, a scenario that they all realized would be catastrophic to their respective interests. Hence, cooperation often seemed better than Cold War. Cooperation often seemed better than Cold War. But leaders were unable to achieve a normal state-to-state -state relationship. They were unable to achieve a protracted stable level of cooperation with one another. They were unable to avoid, modulate, or disengage from a Cold War, even though 
they repeatedly said, not just publicly, but often privately, that they wanted to do just that, to modulate, disengage, or initially even avoid a Cold War. So why was this, a ca why was this the case? This is the real intellectual question that frames my book. Why was it the case that when policymakers often said that they wanted to avoid or modulate a Cold War, they were unable to do so? Why was that the case? By examining that very question, I felt that I could get to the underlying dynamics of the entire Cold War without, in fact, writing a narrative history of the Cold War. My book is definitely not a narrative history of the whole Cold War. In fact, what I do in the book is organize the chapters, the first four chapters, around four critical moments in the Cold War, what I call moments in the Cold War, short periods of time, when officials, in fact, did try to avoid the Cold War or modulate it or disengage from it. First, I look at Stalin, Truman, and the origins of the Cold War from 1945 to 1948. The basic theme of that first chapter is that neither Truman nor Stalin wanted the type of Cold War that emerged, yet it did. How do we understand it? And I try to show that the way to understand it is by linking an assessment of ideology with development, within assessments of the basic developments and, condi and conditions in the international system. In the second chapter, I turn to Malenkov, Eisenhower, and the chance for peace after Stalin's death in 1953 and 1954. After Stalin died, policymakers in Moscow and Washington thought there was a unique moment to reconfigure the relationship, to modulate the tensions in the Cold War. And both sides said they wanted to, but they failed. And I try to analyze why that happened. And then the same thing occurred after the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Khrushchev, Kennedy, and then Johnson all said they needed to lower the threshold of tension, modulate the Cold War, seek detente. But those efforts also by the early or middle of 1965, more or less petered out. And the question, of course, is why. Then finally, in the mid-1970s, after a real detente had been created between Brezhnev and the Nixon administration, it too unraveled in the mid and late 1970s. And the fourth chapter deals with Brezhnev, Carter, and the erosion of detente after the Helsinki conference of 1975. Now in each of these chapters, I try to explain why the efforts to modulate the Cold War, or avoid it at the beginning, failed to take hold. And then, in the last chapter of the book, the chapter that deals with Reagan and with Gorbachev, I try to analyze why they succeeded in the mid and late 1980s? What were the circumstances? What were the ideological changes? And what role did they themselves as leaders play in reconfiguring the nature of the Cold War in the mid and late 1980s? Now, as I look at these different examples, these different moments in the Cold War, I really had five general explanatory factors in mind. These are the factors that over the last 10 to 20 years have emerged in the literature as being basic to understanding the Cold War. So I'm trying to understand why did it continue? One, I looked at or kept in mind or tried to analyze the conditions in the international system, the basic conditions in the international system. For example, in the first chapter, I look at the political ferment in Europe at the end of World War II. That political ferment was the legacy of, World War, uh, of, uh, of the war itself. It had nothing to do really initially with what the United States wanted to do, with the Soviets wanted to do. There was tremendous turmoil 
It was a legacy of the war, and it tremendously shaped the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. Secondly, at the end of the war, the vacuums of power in Japan and Germany had a tremendous impact on the configuration of power as both leaders in Moscow and in Washington worried continuously, incessantly, about the future trajectory of German power. And in later parts of the book, especially in the third and the fourth chapters, I talk about another basic condition in the international system, the process of decolonization and the role of revolutionary nationalism in Asia and Africa and the Middle East and how revolutionary nationalism itself conditioned the responses of people, of the leaders in Moscow as well as in Washington. Basically, these conditions in the international system engendered both at the same time fear and hope. This, this combination of fear and hope. And I show how fear and hope emanating from these basic structural conditions in the international system affected policy at the top echelons in both Washington and Moscow. Now, in order to understand the process of decision-making, I look at a lot at the role of ideology and historical memory. That's the second big variable that I'm concerned with and that has emerged in the literature. Uh, perhaps this is the most decisive explanatory variable of the Cold War in the last 10 or 15, 15 years. I show in the book how ideology shaped perceptions of fear and of opportunity. Ideology itself shaped perceptions of fear and of opportunity given the very real conditions that existed in the international environment, the ones that I've just described. I show how experience and historical memory shaped perceptions of threat. For example, for the Soviet Union, the memory of World War II, the horrors of the occupation, left a lasting le legacy on the leaders from Stalin all the way to Gorbachev, all the way to Gorbachev. In the West, we've sometimes trivialized the impact of World War II on Soviet perceptions, but the more documents we have, the more we realize just how significant was the lasting legacy of the war itself in shaping perceptions. And for Americans, too, the lessons of World War II were extraordinarily salient. What was the most decisive lesson of World War II for American policymakers? It was a simple one, and it went like this. When totalitarian powers gained control of the resources and manpower of Europe and Asia, they used those resources to wage a protracted war against the United States. The great lesson for American officials was that never again, never again, could the United States allow, directly or indirectly, a potential ad adversary to gain control of the preponderant resources of Europe and Asia. That was the legacy of World War II for the national security thinking of all American administrations throughout the Cold War. The third variable I looked at to explain decision-making and why decision-making did not turn out to be as rational as one might think was an assessment of domestic politics and key domestic interest groups and bureaucracies. I try to show how public opinion, how interest groups, how bureaucracies constrain the options of policymakers. For example, in the fourth chapter in my book regarding Brezhnev and detente. Brezhnev really wanted detente, but party bureaucrats and military leaders in the Soviet Union could not resist temptations to take advantage of circumstances in the Third World, in the Horn of Africa, in Southeast Asia, and other places. These very temptations eventually helped to kill detente. 
notwithstanding the fact that Brezhnev himself remained wed to detente until the very, very end. Now, fourthly, I look at the way allies and clients of the United States and the Soviet Union exerted their own pressures on Washington and Moscow. Decision-making in Washington was shaped at critical times by people like Adenauer and de Gaulle, as well as by Ziem and the Shah of Iran. Our allies and clients sometimes had a vested interest themselves in the Cold War or in making sure that certain types of tensions that divided the Soviet Union and the, Uni and the United States were not modulated. And the same we now know is true on the Soviet side. Hanukkah in East Germany, Gomolka, as well as Mao Zedong and Fidel Castro tremendously constrained what the Soviet Union could do and often shaped policy in ways that leaders in Moscow had not intended. Now the fifth variable that I look at, of course, relates to the leaders themselves, to Stalin and Truman, to Eisenhower and Malenkov, to Kennedy and Khrushchev and Johnson, to Carter and Brezhnev, and finally, to Reagan and to Gorbachev. I try to examine them in the context of their times. I try to capture their essential character traits, their presuppositions, their beliefs, their hopes, their fears, their dreams. I try to illuminate the paradoxes and contradictions that inhered in their per personalities and in their policies. For example, Stalin was brutal and he was an ideologue. But neither his cruelty nor his ideology predetermined a clear set of policies. He was enigmatic. He was expedient. He was opportunistic. He spoke clearly, but his intentions and objectives were never clear. One recent biographer says that he dominated his entourage by mystery. Nobody could quite grasp what Stalin really wanted. Stalin distrusted capitalists, and he forever feared encirclement. But Stalin also suspected that cooperation with the United States, so long as cooperation was on his terms, would serve the interests of the Soviet Union. Odarni Westad, the Norwegian historian of the Cold War, one of the best historians of the Cold War, wrote about a decade ago, Stalin's policies were not so much incomprehensible in their parts as incoherent in their whole. And Norman Neymark, the Stanford historian, perhaps one of the most eminent historians of Soviet policies in Germany and in Eastern Europe. He wrote just about a year ago after looking and assessing the new materials, he wrote, Stalin had no master plan. Stalin had not even a road map. Stalin was too tactically expedient and opportunistic, claimed Neymark. Truman too was very interesting, and the inconsistencies in his policies at times are striking. He was extraordinarily fearful of the growth of Soviet power, not fearful of Soviet military aggression, but fearful that the Soviet Union could exploit conditions in Western Europe and Germany to promote its own interests. He was extremely fearful of Soviet power but he felt little antipathy to Stalin himself. I like him, quote, end quote, he wrote his wife after meeting Stalin at the Potsdam Conference. 
And what's striking about a decade later, in the middle 1950s, Truman gave a talk at Columbia University in which he reflected on the wartime experiences. And of course, by the 1950s, even mid-50s, even more was known about the horrors of Stalinism. And yet Truman rather unreservedly repeated, yes, when I met Stalin at Potsdam, I liked him. I thought I could get along with him. His record of brutality did not shape American policies, but fear of Soviet power or potential power was extraordinarily influential in shaping American foreign policies. Khrushchev, too, was a man of paradox. He was a Stalinist. He was soaked in the blood of Stalin's enemies. He was one of the orchestrators of the purges in the Ukraine in the middle 1930s. And yet, by the middle 1950s and late 1950s, his overriding goal was to excise Stalinism from the Soviet system. And if you read the minutes of the Politburo during his reign in the late 1950s, and especially in the early 1960s, was the degree to which he continually hectored and berated his comrades on the Politburo that they weren't doing enough to make the system work properly for the well-being of the Soviet Union. They weren't doing enough to produce grain, to produce food, to promote health care, to promote educational opportunities. They had to perform better. And frankly, if you read those minutes, Khrushchev emerges as rather insufferable. But it illuminates, nonetheless, the degree to which he really believed that he had to make the system work better. That was his obligation, and it should work better. Johnson, he knew that public opinion in early 1965 did not favor escalation in Vietnam. But, no, but nonetheless, he knew he would be hammered by his political foes if his policies failed. Therefore, in the early months of 1965, he began bombing North Vietnam, even though he knew explicitly that such actions would have an adverse impact on his own desire to promote detente with the Kremlin. And then most interesting of all are Gorbachev and Reagan at the end of the Cold War. Gorbachev, I want to emphasize, and I do emphasize in the book, was, a de was dedicated to communist ideals. But what was so interesting was that he reconceived fundamental Marxist-Leninist assumptions about threat and opportunity. He liberated himself from fears of encirclement. He did not think anybody would attack the Soviet Union given the Kremlin's retaliatory capabilities. But significantly, at the same time, Gorbachev came to appreciate that his capitalist foes genuinely feared Soviet power. His foes feared Soviet power. He realized, therefore, that he had to alter the image of the Soviet Union in the West and allay the West's perception of threat in order to break out of the security dilemma and ratchet down the arms race. Fulton in reverse, he told his comrades in the Politburo, referring to Churchill's speech in March 1946, when Churchill's specter of communism and the Soviet Union on the march generated such fears of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev told his colleagues, we need to do Fulton in reverse to tamp down the fears of the West, to reassure them, therefore enabling us to modulate the arms race so that resources could be shifted to domestic priorities. And Reagan, too, comes across in his archival materials now as a very surprising president. He despised communism. We all know that. But what we don't know is the degree to which he came to understand 
his Soviet adversary. Reagan's greatness was not his buildup of middle military strength, but his willingness to negotiate with his adversary and his ability to inspire trust ultimately in the Kremlin. So let me state very briefly before I conclude the principal argument in my book, the principal arguments. The Cold War began and it lasted for four decades because leaders were trapped by their ideas and ideals and because they will be leaguered by dangers that lurked in the international system. Their beliefs and their memories, moreover, heightened their sense of danger and accentuated messianic impulses. And in contrast, the Cold War ended when Gorbachev came to believe that external threats, threats from abroad, were small. But equally important, the Cold War ended when Gorbachev came to believe that external opportunities for Soviet gain were even smaller. The Soviet Union, Gorbachev said, was encircled not by invincible armies, but by superior economies. And therefore, he needed to shift his own focus to domestic priorities. In my book throughout, I try to show that ideology, the structure of the international system, and human agency are interrelated. They constitute a woven fabric, not individual pieces of cloth. In the struggle for the soul of mankind, what ultimately mattered most was not a great power's capacity to project force, but its capacity to offer a better way of life to its own people and to other peoples. I think that's one of the great lessons of the Cold War. The Kremlin seemed a formidable foe when the Great Depression and two world wars had discredited democratic capitalism. The Kremlin seemed a formidable foe in the 1950s and 1960s when it appeared to unlock the secrets of rapid modernization, when it appeared to be capable of providing educational opportunity and of nurturing scientific advancement like Sputnik, when its growth rates appeared relatively high, and when the Soviet Union could readily discredit the West for its imperial record in Asia and Africa. But the Soviet Union could not compete for the soul of mankind when the era of revolutionary nationalism and decolonization ended, as it did end in the mid-1970s after the breakup of the Portuguese Empire. And the Soviet Union could not compete for the soul of mankind when it became apparent about the same time in the mid and late 1970s that the Kremlin could not make good on its promises to its own people that the system, that the communist system could satisfy the needs of Soviet citizens for health care and for housing. And therefore, the system could not sustain the loyalty and commitment of the Soviet people. Gorbachev's uniqueness was that he actually realized what was happening and wanted to alter the trends. Success for Gorbachev depended on democratizing socialism, on making socialism work for the benefit of his people. What's significant is that in pursuit of this, democratizing socialism and making it work for his own people, in pursuit of that, he failed absolutely. But at the same time, he ended the Cold War. In a certain way, in conclusion, my book is about lost opportunities. It shows 
that opportunities are lost when leaders who wield great power are engulfed by circumstance, when they are entrapped by ideology, and when they are haunted by fears of domestic political foes. But my book is also about hope because my book shows that extraordinary leaders can transcend their circumstances. They can grow and they can learn to appreciate the fears and aspirations of adversaries. And when they do, they not only have the possibility to inspire dreams of a better world, but they also have the opportunity to liberate humankind from the bonds of memory and ideology. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mel. I think um, it's become very clear to, to you, I think, uh, to what extent Mel has really wrestled with these issues. And I remember from your year here, I was just so struck. Um, I don't think I've ever met, um, I've met many other scholars who have wrestled with these issues, getting to the core, to the essence of the Cold War, as much as Mel has. Um, Thank you also for um, your nice words about the Cold War project. I should say that that in turn should uh, uh, re or return this with thanks for y to you for all your advice um, and encouragement over the years. And um, just to be very clear, the Cold War project is not a one man or a three person or um, uh, effort. It's a real international effort that um, profits and benefits from the advice of many, and some of those who are, have contributed immensely over the years are here in the audience. Uh, Warren Cohen, who is one of the founding fathers of the Cold War Project, um, is in the back, or scholars. Um, Sam Wells is all the way in the back as well. He also has been involved for the entirety of uh, the life of the project in it, um, but also visiting scholars um, who have been here. I'm thinking of uh, Anna Nelson, who is in the back, who just finished her stint here at the center, or Pavel Matsevich from Poland, uh, who is uh, in his last week here at the center working on the events of 1956. Uh, let me also recognize in the audience, I should have done this far earlier, Phyllis Leffler. Phyllis, uh, um, I know this, uh, nobody will be happier to celebrate uh, <laughs> this accomplishment than you, I'm sure. Um, we have another giant in the field to comment um, on this landmark publication, and that is Professor Robert Beisner. To my right, he is, of course, the Professor Emeritus of American University an author most recently of Dean Acheson, A Life in the Cold War, which was honored by the Council on Foreign Relations with its silver medal. His first book, Twelve Against Empire, the Anti-Imperialists, 1898 to 1900, was published in 1968 and received the Alan Nevins Prize from the Society of American Historians and the John Dunning Prize from the American Historical Association. He is also the author of From the Old Diplomacy to the New, 1865 to 1900, and co-editor of Arms at Rest, Peacemaking and Peacekeeping in American History. He was editor of the Bibliographic Guide to Foreign Relations of the United States. Besides teaching at American University, he held numerous administra administrative and committee posts, chairing the Department of History over there for nearly a decade, um, and in the College of Arts and Sciences Educational Policy Committee from 1986 to 87 serving as vice chair of the university senate and directing the university's American University's general education program. It's with great privilege and pleasure that I introduce you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for that generous introduction, especially the giant. I like. I remember that one. Uh, I too am really pleased to be at the Wilson Center again, and want to thank uh, Christian for all his uh, work to set up this session. I'm particularly pleased at the young audience. Uh, it's almost, almost enough to make me want to come out of retirement and teach. <laughs> but it's terrific to have you here. For the Soul of Mankind is a remarkable book, one of the very best on, on the history of the Cold War. Um, Melvin Leffler asks questions that most historians avoid. All historians try to explain in one way or another why something happened. But, but as soon as you ask this question, you implicitly are also asking another question. Why did it happen then? Or why did something not happen then? Mel brings this question to the surface, deals with it explicitly, and that inevitably leads him, brings him to counterfactual analysis, which the subject requires. The gist of the book consists of five main chapters, ranging from 67 to 113 pages in length. Any one of them could stand up as a valuable, brief synthesis of the subjects and periods they cover. The book has a very definite architecture. It's almost schematic. Let me illustrate by reading a quotation from the conclusion of chapter three where Leffler writes that leaders on both sides, quote, could not transcend their past, overcome their fears, modify their aspirations, escape the pressure of allies, or ignore domestic political adversaries. They felt peril, and they glimpsed salvation. They had nowhere to go once they escaped from Armageddon, but back to the Cold War, end quote. At times, I think, as I thought with the preponderance of power, that Mel is a little too concerned to keep this scheme up front in its entirety at all moments, but it works. I have some questions. There were times that I felt that I detected what I will call, what I will call an equivalency thesis what Mel calls even-handedness. Um, if so, it's partly the result of, uh, I think, the, of an implicit use of security dilemma analysis, which suggests that fears were all of a kind. So too, the actions in response, whether from Moscow or Washington. And I have to ask, is it really true that neither side was more culpable than the other. And this leads to some questions about his treatment of Soviet leaders, particularly Stalin. Was Stalin, as Melvin tells us, really trying to hold the World War II alliance together? What about all the instances of non-cooperation with the rest of the alliance during the war itself? On Lend-Lease, on the disposition of downed U.S. bombers in the Soviet Union, refusing to allow the United States to establish air bases in the Soviet Union to shorten bombing runs to Germany. At one point, Mel tells us that Stalin thought that Secretary of State James Burns exercised power flagrantly. I had to laugh at the pot calling the kettle black. Or why, as is implied, although Mel doesn't directly state it, should the West accept or cooperate with a USSR that was planning even a, quote, peaceful, end quote, takeover of Eastern Europe? At one point, Mel writes, Americans, quote, and this seems to be a criticism, Americans did not ask if Stalin was different from Hitler. Was he? 
Since Mel is abundantly clear, he agrees that Stalin was a monster. How th can he think it was really possible to work with him? It also seems to me, this is not a major point, but a little naive to accept the sincerity or the uncomplicated sincerity of Soviet leaders' statements about wanting peace. Going back to a book I wrote a long time ago, William McKinley wanted peace in 1898, too. But he also wanted a whole lot of things that he could get only through war. Of all the major leaders in the 20th century who led nations that instigated war, the only one I can think of who openly disdained peace was Hitler. Even Kim Il-sung always claimed that Syngman Rhee struck first. At the least, wanting peace seems to me a minimal accomplishment. The book is about constraints. I'm oddly reminded at constraints and how much maneuvering room leaders had within those constraints. I'm oddly reminded of John Lewis Gaddis's The United States and the Origins of the Cold War, 1941 to 47, published now 35 years ago, which astonishes me. It also emphasizes constraints. But Gaddis concluded that the dictator Stalin had far more room for maneuver than the democratically elected Truman, and thus bore the greater responsibility not so much for the origins of the Cold War as for its intensification and continuation. And as to the various meticulously described constraints, I wonder if Mel, if he has time, could address himself to the question that in the end, is he arguing that Reagan and Gorbachev broke through those constraints? threw them off, or did they succeed because the nature of the constraints changed? I think I understand why we don't have a chapter on Nixon and Kissinger, but, sure, I'm, but I'm curious. I'd like to hear what Mel says. I, I understand what the chapter, the chapter on Carter and Brezhnev tells how the detente set up by Nixon and Kissinger didn't work, but he, we don't hear m much about them. Surely these two hard-bitten realists escaped the constraint of ideology and seemed to care little about domestic constraints. And yet even the detente they established was fragile and began to erode before Carter or Ford, even, I mean, while they were still in office. Another question. I, uh, among the kinds of realism, I, I think of two that may be pertinent here. The, the one kind of realist doesn't care about ideology or the internal workings of another society. Another is a Hobbesian who sees conflict, war, evil as the norm rather than the exception. Which kind of U.S. stance a realist stance, or what today is called a neoconservative stance, would have been more likely to shake loose the Cold War perpetuating constraints. Or to put it another way, in each of the failures Mel describes, I'd like to know what he thinks the leaders might have done, been able actually to do, to escape the constraints on them. Having expertly described and analyzed the forces working against settlement, does he think one side or the other could have overcome those forces toward a breakout of peace earlier? I don't understand, and, and Mel's not going to be able to answer all of this in detail, but you should read the book. I don't understand quite why Gorbachev gets all the credit for ending the Cold War. Leffler tells us that George Kennan turned out to be right. 
that if you contain the Soviet Union long enough, its power will finally erode and we will win. And then Mel says that's what happened. But, George, but Gorbachev gets the credit for it. Reagan gets a lot of applause, but not the larger of the bouquets. Finally, a few concluding remarks. This is a beautifully written book. It's not only wonderfully clear, but elegant and forceful. Let me read you just a brief passage in the first chapter. Speaking of Stalin, quote, his lust for power was absolute. No longer did it suffice to defeat his foes. Stalin now had to have them executed. They might recant. They might admit they were enemies of the revolution, but they had to die. Tortured, they might acknowledge falsely that they conspired against Stalin or the state or socialism, but they had to die. They might acknowledge that they had schemed with enemies abroad, but they had to die. His old comrades from the revolution, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Bukharin, were shot. His former allies in the Politburo were shot. His military chieftains were shot. Friends and relatives were shot. The executioners were then shot. He also has a fine eye for the wonderful quotation such as Gorbachev, excuse me, Khrushchev's remark that Stalin feared his enemies and killed his friends. I have to ask, what was it in the 1950s about ducks? Not only do we have mail reports, C.D. Jackson and the Eisenhower administration saying that colonialism was, quote, today a moribund duck, end quote. But this was the period in which, from my own research, I will tell you, that Richard Patterson, an abysmally incompetent ambassador to Yugoslavia and Guatemala, invented the duck test, namely that someone who looked, swam, and quacked like a duck surely was a duck. One thing I've always liked about Leffler is his refusal to flinch in the face of conclusions his evidence and analysis lead him to. This book shows how far historians have come from both the realist and the 1970s revisionist interpretations of the early Cold War, and from how both those schools very differently treated ideology. Another example of not flinching, and this is similar to his unflinchingness in preponderance of power. He tells us that Gorbachev and Shervodnadze dealt with Bush 41 and Baker as, quote, supplicants. At the outset of the Cold War, Truman had said that there would, could be cooperation between Moscow and Washington if the United States got its way 85% of the time, now that was happening, end quote. With no signs of triumphalism, Leffler makes no bones about who won and who lost in 1989 to 91. It's a remarkably balanced and wise book. And I want to conclude with one last question in the future how will the fears and memories generated by our own times affect American attitudes and beliefs about acting in the world at large? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have to say, when Bob came up before the meeting, he says, you know, Christian, I'm slightly biased. I'm an old friend of Mel's. I thought, oh, but I'm very glad um, that you raised some important questions, some important issues, and helped us start off with a discussion um, here. I'd like to give Mel a chance to um, respond um, to the extent he would like to um, Bob's questions, but um, also like to invite you um, to join in with questions, small or big, and comments. Uh, we are webcasting this event live, so I would uh, 
kindly ask you to wait until you are given the microphone. On each side we have microphones, and if you could please identify yourself. Um, we have about 20 or so minutes for discussion. And Mel, if, if um, you don't mind, I would sort of start off with taking some questions and then give you a chance to respond to a number of them, including um, Professor Beisner's questions. That's great. Yes, Svetlana Savranskaya in the center. Savranska, the National Security Archive. I have two questions. On Gorbachev's communist views, uh, do you see any evolution of those views, or do you believe that they continued until the end of the Cold War and meant the same for him? And my second question is about this last quotation about Gorbachev and Shevardnadze dealing with Bush and um, American administrations both as supplicants. Um, would you please talk a little bit about it? Um, do you have any particular period in mind? Um, would you say that was the case for the entire years of Gorbachev in power or just 1989? That's very interesting. And what's the basis for that judgment? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Svetlana. Um, the, uh, I mean, your, your question, your first question about Gor the, the degree to which Gorbachev's views, uh, communist views, uh, evolved over time, uh, is an important part of my book, actually, in uh, the chapter uh, on Gorbachev, and I try to sort of um, illuminate. Uh, the wrenching exercise that he really went through, as I see it, from 1986 to 19, 1989, I think his, 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 some of the, his basic assumptions about the way capitalist countries operated did change, and that profoundly shaped um, uh, his policies. Uh, most particularly, he wrestled for the, with the question were, uh, with, with the question, were capitalist countries inherently hostile? Um, could there really be a change in the way capitalist nations uh, perceived uh, communist nations and the way they dealt with them? And, he, and, and that's in part in that famous report that they discussed, I think it's in 1988 uh, in the Politburo. They actually you know, wrestle with that question. And in, a, in, in some key speeches, uh, Gorbachev states, and significantly, significantly states, that you know, the, the West now can live with us. Um, capitalist countries need not necessarily be inherently hostile. Capitalists themselves can overcome the dynamics, you might say, of the free market economy and, and can accommodate us. And there are issues that there are more issues that bind us together with the West than divide us. So I think, um, and then when he renounces, as does Shevardnadze, sort of the, you know, in simple terms, the class basis of international relations, um, in, late in 1987 and remarkably openly in 1988, these reflect, reflect uh, profoundly significant views. But most importantly, um, and, and here it, it relates to, um, to one of the basic questions that Bob Beisner asked, is, you know, what could other officials have done to break through the constraints? Um, why do I give uh, um, Gorbachev um, as much credit as I do for ending the Cold War? I don't give him, as Bob said, I think, um, just to generalize and to be bold and provocative, uh, that I, I say Gorbachev won the Cold War. I don't say that at all. I say, I, uh, or, or that Gorbachev was the only person responsible. They, she, I, in my book, is very clear that both Reagan and Gorbachev deserve credit for bringing the Cold War to an end, although I'm also um, absolutely clear that Gorbachev deserves more credit than Reagan. Why does, he des why does he deserve the credit? What did he do that other policymakers did not do? One, every policymaker um, during, during the, the Cold War, Malenkov, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, 
uh, everybody, on drop up, every, everybody understood the arms race was crazy. Everybody understood that nuclear weapons could not really be used. Everyone understood that the, the arms buildup was irrational. But only one person acted on that. I mean, Westerners believe that too. Every American president realized that as well. What was different about Gorbachev? What was different about Gorbachev was that he not only believed in the notion as what we would call it of minimum deterrence in the West, but he acted upon it. He said, no one's going to attack us. When we have thousands and thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons, it's completely irrational to think that anybody is going to attack us. So what can we do? We can begin to ratchet down the arms race. And I know now that the West is fearful. What, what was different about Gorbachev is that he came to appreciate, it. yes, the West is honestly fearful of us. And so what do we need to do? We need to take big risks. Even though Reagan might be building up armaments, we need to ramp them down. We need to take that risk. That took incredible courage, in, and it also, of course, could only happen in a dictatorship of the proletariat, where Gorbachev really could push these things through. So that's what made you know, Gorbachev distinctive, and it was the evolution of those views that were, were so very, very important. Thank you, Mel. Uh, let me also encourage the high school and college students here uh, present here to ask questions, even what may seem to be uh, a, a simple question. Sometimes those are the hardest, hardest ones, and you you have one singular advantage over um, certainly the panelists here and um, many others in the audience. You uh, didn't have to live through the Cold War, and you have a historical distance there that uh, can that you can turn to your advantage. Yes. Sure, I have two brief questions. The first is, if there's little disagreement as to when the Cold War ended, uh, when do you believe it started? Could you date it from the October Revolution or from the catastrophic Soviet losses in World War II? And my second question is, as much as we may credit Gorbachev, it's, I think, undeniable that when he fell from power, there was no leader so admired abroad and so detested at home. So could you go into this paradox a bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when, did the, when did the Cold War begin? Well, the ide ideological antipathy uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States began in 1917. Uh, Arno Mayer and Gordon, and Gordon Levin and everybody else who wrote you know, 30, 40 years ago, sort of Lenin versus Wilson, um, that that uh, ideological antipathy was there from the moment of the Bolshevik Revolution. But that does not mean that the I would not date the origins of the Cold War to that, um, because I don't think anybody in the 1920s or early 1930s really thought they were involved in a Cold War, because the Cold War involved both ideological antipathy and geopolitical threat. And in the interwar years, the Soviet Union did not represent a geopolitical and strategic threat to the United States. That emerged at the end of World War II, and that was the result of the vacuums of power and political ferment um, that were the consequence of World War II and that Stalin or any Soviet leader had the potential to capitalize on. The Soviet Union was a mighty military power, much weaker than the United States, but nevertheless much stronger than anybody else in Europe in 1945. But even more politically, it had a system um, that seemed attractive to people who were terribly demoralized. And so it's, uh, that combination of ideological appeal on the one hand and ideological antipathy to the West on the other hand, plus geopolitical threat that constituted the Cold War and that emerges somewhere in this period between 1945 and, and, and 1947. Um, Stephen, the, you know, the other question that, that you raise about the paradox between you know, Gorbachev uh, being the uh, um, the most, perhaps the most popular man in the world, certainly in the West in 1989 and, or 1990, and, the, you know, one of the most discredited and, um, and um, despised leaders uh, within the Soviet Union. That, 
that that is of course true. Um, and um, I would say that one reason that Gorbachev and Shevardnadze appear as supplicants, getting back to Svetlana's um, uh, point um, uh, a few minutes ago, is that you know increasingly uh, in 1989 and 1990, as as the support inside the Soviet Union erodes. Um, and Gorbachev becomes more and more dependent on, on the West's goodwill, in part as a, 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 as a desperate effort to sort of um, r retain his popularity or at least his hold on his own, on, uh, on, on his own members of, of the Politburo. But um, yes, I mean, he's popular in the West because he's making all these incredible concessions. He's very unpopular at home because of those very concessions that he's making. I mean, when he agrees, for example, to accept a unified Germany in, inside NATO, this is an incredible concession that engenders enormous amount of hostility um, within, you know, with all, within all matters, with, within all, uh, within the party, within the government, um, uh, w you know, within the Kremlin, within the army. But at the same time, the very fact that he's trying to reform the system, but that his reforms are continually failing, I mean, he's trying to make communism work better, but it's not working at all. Gorbachev had a clue um, about, he had a concept about how to defuse the Cold War, how to tamp down the Cold War, how to allay fears in the West. He had a, an approach to foreign policy. What he didn't have was any strategy to make his domestic reforms work, and they were a fiasco. And so both the, weak, the, the perception of growing Soviet weakness combined with a, uh, with a deteriorating economy uh, tremendously discredits uh, Gorbachev at home, even while his concessions to the West and his unilateral arms reductions and all the rest make him extraordinarily popular um, in, in the West. So that irony is there. Thank you. All the way in the back. Hi, uh, Garrett Martin, George Washington University. Uh, two quick questions. I mean, the first one is you talk about missed opportunities. And uh, apart from the Reagan-Gorbachev situation, did you feel that in the other cases, the leaders in both Washington and Moscow had a clear vision of what the, the post-Cold War world might look like? And the second question is obviously there's been two other very prominent books on the Cold War recently, uh, Arnie Westad and John Gaddis. And I'm wondering, did those books shape your own thought process, and how do you position your own book vis-a-vis -vis those two publications? Well, I, th I think um, there were missed opportunities uh, th um, throughout the Cold War. Um, the extent to which they, those opportunities might have been grasped, um, the extent to which they might have been grasped is, is, is thorough, thoroughly arguable. No, uh, a simple answer to your question, did they, did they have, did policymakers have a clear vision of a post-Cold War era? No, nor did Reagan and Gorbachev or Bush have a clear vision of the post-Cold War era. But you didn't have to have a clear vision of the post-Cold War era to understand what types of things you might need to do to modulate the tensions. And throughout the Cold War, as I show, policymakers did understand and did discuss repeatedly the advantages and disadvantages of the steps that they needed to take in order to tamp down the Cold War, um, and they studied them, um, sometimes in meticulous detail. But from their perspective, they often thought that they all often realized that there were advantages, but then when they really grappled with it, they felt that the disadvantages outweighed the, the advantages. So that other policymakers in the Soviet Union a Brezhnev, for example, from time to time understood that it would be great to limit armaments. He certainly understood that the arms race was 
irrational. Brez Brezhnev understood that, um, but um, he was he didn't have the self confidence. He didn't have the uh, political clout. He didn't have the wherewithal to make good on that perception. It wasn't worth it, given the disadvantages that he felt might ensue from pursuing that, 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 that insight. Gorbachev, on the other hand, you know, did pursue that insight, and it made, made, a, made a tremendous dis, um, uh, difference. Um, the other question about um, you know, how my book relates to, um, to the, to the uh, books by uh, Arnie Westad and, and John Gaddis, um, I've been very much influenced uh, in my work by Arnie Westad and by my uh, former colleague Chen Zhen um, and by other people who have written in recent years uh, about ideology and especially about the, r the role of ideology in the Cold War. Um, I think uh, Westad's book on, uh, on the global Cold War, you know, is a, you know, is a, is, is a terrific account um, of what motivated Soviet and American policy uh, in, in a bunch of third world trouble spots. Um, and um, and the role of ideology uh, in, in in motivating those actions on both sides. Um, Westad's um, uh, you know Westad's writings you know have definitely uh, had a significant influence on me. I you know I you know significantly disagree you know with Arnie Westad in this in the way I conceptualize the Cold War because you know. Um, Westad's global Cold War is a Cold War that only exists in the Third World. Um, it's hard to it's hard for me to imagine an overall account of the Cold War that doesn't put Germany at the heart of the Cold War. That doesn't deal with the strategic arms race. Um, and uh, so, in my effort, is an effort to write a more synthetic account. It tries to encompass the types of issues that Arnie Westad beautifully and deftly deals with, uh, but it's also to try to highlight just how important Europe was, how important Germany was, how important the strategic arms race was in terms of the larger context. What I try to do in my book is to really integrate and synthesize what's going on in Europe, what's going on in the, th in the third world. It's not easy to do all of that, and maybe there are you know numerous times when I don't do it as well as I might have, but that you know, but that's what I am trying uh, to do there. Um, you know, throughout my career, throughout my career, um, you know, I've often be s been seen in juxtaposition uh, with with John Gaddis. Um, I I think that his you know most recent book that he wrote two or three years ago. Um, was a was a far better book than um, we now know, which he published a decade ago, which I wrote a long, um, you know, assessment of in the American Historical Review, trying to illuminate at least what I thought were some of the shortcomings. I think that um, that that Gaddis's synthetic account of two three years ago um, is 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 a far better book, but it's a book with which anyone reading my book will see that uh, I seriously disagree. Um, I think, you know, basically one of the differences, and it gets to uh, Bob Beisner's, you know, initial statement, you know, that, um, uh, that, that I'm guilty of moral equivalency. I really dispute that statement. I don't think that I'm guilty uh, of moral equivalency. No one would charge John Gaddis with being guilty of moral equivalency. So why am I charged with being guilty of moral equivalency, but John Gaddis is not charged with being um, a, a guilty of moral equivalency? John isn't guilty of moral equivalency, but that's because he's most, you know, maybe this is not an altogether fair statement, um, but, you know, John is very, he, he writes brilliantly about lots of things, um, but he is, you know, very concerned with making moral judgments. And in some ways, um, you know, I respect him a lot for that. I mean, you know, he's a voice. It doesn't necessarily mean I, I agree with everything he says, but um, he has, you know, a lot of integrity in stating uh, his convictions clearly and unequivocally. It's true that I'm less interested um, in making 
moral judgments and far more interested in trying to explain why things happen. And when you try to explain why things happen, uh, you get involved in the, in really the interstices of events and trying to understand how policymakers motivated, motive, uh, um, what, what considerations motivated policymakers. My book um, is just unremittingly critical of Stalin and in many ways unremittingly, unremittingly critical of the Soviet communist system. So I don't think it's a book about moral equivalency. But I do say that Stalin had good reason to fear. Um, I do show the impact of World War II on Soviet citizens, uh, on Stalin. Um, I try to show the impact of the Nazi occupation. Um, as Richard Overy, no revisionist, he, you know, would say that, uh, has written, you know, it wasn't imagination uh, for Soviet leaders to think that they lived in a hostile world. They did live in a hostile world. And it's important to understand their perceptions if you want to know why the Cold War existed uh, or came about. Those perceptions weren't fabricated. Anyone who had just experienced an occupation of their homeland and had seen the Nazis kill, you know, kill 12 million, of course there were about 27 million Soviet citizens who died during World War II. I think the Nazis killed about 12 million and occupied the territory of the Soviet Union. You're going to be concerned uh, with security after the war. And um, I try to explain that. That doesn't mean I'm assigning moral equivalency. It does mean I'm trying to understand and illuminate why foreign policy is made the way it is. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but let's take a couple of uh, final questions. Um, okay, the gentleman right there in the blue shirt. Uh, Marcia, uh, my name is Wally Alka Khan from Marshall High School. In which of the five case or cases did we come closest to ending the Cold War? Thank you. Good question. Let's take a couple more questions and then give Mel and um, perhaps Bob if he likes the uh, one. one. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Um, I'll have to wait for the microphone down here. I'm curious about why not a chapter on Kissinger and Nixon. Yes. And who are you? Jeffrey James. Thank you. And the uh, gentleman in the back. And then gentleman. Hi, I'm Larry right. Socher from Georgetown Prep. I'm a teacher there. Um, you mentioned a little bit about Gorbachev's development over time, and I was just wondering if you could share some, like a partner question on Ronald Reagan. His greatness lies in negotiation. Is that something that he arrived at or did he started at? Or we always remember him for his rhetoric, so maybe if you could comment on that a bit. Yeah. Okay. We'll take... Billy, two more final questions here. This uh, young gentleman up here, and, uh, and you've got the final. Oh, hey, I'm Julian. Um, how important do you believe is assigning blame to um, understanding the full scope of the Cold War? Thank you. And final question up there. Um, Anton Fidyash from Georgetown University. Dr. Leffler, I'd just <clears throat> like to know, in all the documents that you've looked at, how much anticipation did you find from the Soviet leadership of American elections? Any waiting out of lame duck presidents, stuff like that, waiting for parties to change? And what does that tell us about the constraints, the intellectual constraints of the Cold War as a system? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, these uh, wonderful questions. I especially love the question from the high school students. I've, I've been at the Wilson Center before when, when high school students have been here, and I remember after one discussion, a bunch of students came up and said to me, we've read your book, The Specter of Communism, and we love the security dilemma. And I say, my 
God, students coming up and telling me they love the, the, you know, the, 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 secu the, the security dile dilemma. And I was so profoundly um, uh, inspired by the idea that the high school students are reading it and grappling with ideas like, like the security dilemma. That, that's, that's fantastic. So um, this question by Wally about, you know, wh which of the five cases was most important in terms of ending the Cold War, you know, unmistakably the most important, uh, you know, case is, is, is the one that I illuminate in the last chapter about, you know, about Reagan and, um, and, and Gorbachev. I mean, it was the effort of those two people. They, br they brought about, they overcame the constraints. I mean, Bob Beisner asked a wonderful question when he said, you know, was it, you know, did the constraints change or did they overcome the, uh, the constraints? And some of the constraints did change. The structure of the international system, the end of revolutionary nationalism and decolonization provided a more permissive atmosphere, you might say, for, 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 ending, for ending the Cold War. But it took very determined, in my uh, opinion, it took very determined leadership by, by Gorbachev uh, and, and, and by Reagan, and, and that's clearly where you see uh, the end of the Cold War. And, that, and that's where the question uh, by Larry, you know, from, from Georgetown Prep is a really good question about um, Reagan and his penchant for, for negotiation, because this is something that's uh, generally not, not known uh, in, the, in the literature or not focused on. And one of the great surprises for me when I went out to the Reagan Library uh, was to uncover these 10, 12, or 14 letters, I, f I forget how many there were, that Reagan himself you know, wrote first to Brezhnev, uh, then to uh, Andropov, then to Chernenko. Um, you know, we didn't know about these letters. These were, pri for the most part, private letters. Several of them were handwritten, purposefully handwritten letters in order to impose Reagan's own sense of authenticity that he really wanted the Soviet leaders to know that he himself was writing these letters. And what's striking in these letters is that even at the same time that he's using publicly this rhetoric about an evil empire and the repugnance of the Soviet system, he's writing private letters that say explicitly, and I quote them uh, in great detail in the book, because we know so little about these letters, they've not emerged in the scholarship. He's writing to Soviet leaders saying, we really want to, I really want to get along with you. I want to nurture a new relationship. Um, I'm not looking to destroy the Soviet system. I simply want to have a stable relationship. I'm looking to negotiate, you know, arms reductions. Uh, we can engage. I understand, um, you know, the suffering um, that, your, that, that the Soviet people have experienced. I understand your Soviet, the Soviet perception of threat. He writes all these things time and time again. And part of the reason he writes this is that he's learned a lot in 1982 and 83 and 84. And if you read Reagan's diary entries, you know, he says, I've come to appreciate the fact that Soviet leaders um, do fear the West. Um, I didn't believe that. But now I do believe it, he writes. Maybe I should have known it, he, he, he writes. Maybe I should have known that all along. But I didn't know it. But now I do. And so one of the things I say that is you know, really significant and important and for which Reagan deserves great credit was that he did learn. He did appreciate Soviet sensibilities. And he, was, he not only wanted to negotiate, but in his own way, he is a very, very effective negotiator. After all, you know, Gorbachev did make 85% or 90% uh, you know, of the concessions. Reagan didn't, Gorbachev did. Um, and um, I think that one of the lessons of the Cold War uh, for our own time is that it's important to negotiate with the adversary. Reagan realized that from early on in his administration. He just didn't have anybody really to negotiate with for very complex reasons. Negotiating with an adversary doesn't necessarily mean that you make concessions to your adversary. Reagan made few concessions. But in the process of negotiation, in the process of preparing to negotiate, he learned a lot about his potential adversary, about his real adversary, that served him and the United States and the world uh, ver very, very well. Um, how important, um, I, I, Julian asked, uh, how important is assigning blame um, in, in, in studying the, the Cold War? 
Um, I think if you, you know, if your major preoccupation is assigning blame, um, then it's hard really to understand uh, the Cold War. If you try first to understand why the Cold War evolved um, and understand the perceptions uh, of both sides, um, then your ability to make judgments um, you know, grows more and more acute. So the important thing is to start with an assessment of an evidence, with, uh, with an assessment of the evidence. The important thing is to try to get into the heads of the policymakers, to understand you know, what they perceived, uh, what they feared, what they hoped for. Um, some of the leaders um, on the Soviet side, as some of the leaders on the American side, uh, were good and bad. Um, the, you know, Khrushchev had some remarkably good qualities to him and some remarkably horrible qualities to, uh, to, to him. Um, and the, the, I think it's the object of the historian to try to sort of illuminate in a textured way the good and the bad um, and, um, and then to, to make appropriate judgments after you look at, at, all the, at all the evidence. Now finally, why is there no chapter uh, on, on uh, Nix Nixon and, and Kissinger? And it's because of the, um, the answer is a very simple one. It's because of the architecture of the book. Um, the, basically, the book is about why efforts to um, establish detente or to modulate tensions, why they failed, why they failed. Um, and, um, and by understanding why they failed, then you can, in my view, understand the larger dynamics of the Cold War. So Kissinger and, um, and Nixon were extremely important um, in creating detente. And if I were writing a book about creating detente, I would have had an entire chapter on, on, on Nixon and Kissinger. Now, one could say quite rightly that actually detente began to unravel. Um, you know, even before Jimmy Carter. Uh, detente began to unravel really in 1975 and 1976, um, you know, under, under Ford, as well, and, and I show a little bit of that. But basically, um, when Carter became president, his initial instinct was to try to revive detente. He didn't call it that, but that was in essence um, what he was trying to do. He had a flawed strategy, I show, for doing that, but that was that was his um, intention. And at the same time, Brezhnev was very interested um, in sustaining detente. And so I put the emphasis on the unraveling of detente in the, late, in, the, in the mid and late 1970s. And it's because I'm interested in why detente unravels, why efforts to relax tensions don't work out in the long run. Um, that I, it's because of that architecture that I do not have a whole chapter uh, or, or really spend much attention at all uh, on, Nick, on Nixon and Kissinger. Well, thank you very much. We're at the end of our seminar today. Um, let me just say you all have, uh, in a sense, become part of Cold War history because this session will be taped and or is being taped and will be archived and is going to be available on our website cwihp.org in a few days um, for months and years to come. Uh, today is the official publication day of For the Soul, Soul of Mankind. Um, it is The book is For Your Convenience uh, for Sale Outside, I believe at a discount. Let me in conclusion um, thank um, Professor Beisner for his very thoughtful and stimulating comments and congratulate Mel once more on this remarkable landmark accomplishment. Let me all invite you to, uh, um, uh, well, some of you to wine and the rest of you <laughs> to some snacks over in the boardroom. If you wouldn't mind after, uh, letting Professor um, Professor's um, left